viewers, it's my pleasure to present the fourth webinar of IOA Meet Preservation Subcommittee, one topic, one speaker. And today we have Dr. Bidin, probably the most learned PCO, PO and STO specialist with us. And he'll be giving one talk, one speaker, and he'll be giving us all the inside of PCVO. And as all of us are aware, we have a prevalence of 3.3%. We have about 46 million patients. And Indians have the need to sit cross legged and squat on the floor for activity of daily living and for social cultural needs. And financially, we spend only so much that we are on the 45th position out of 94 countries evaluated for this healthcare index. That means we have to have a method which have our resources allow us and which we can do. And as I have always been saying, we have three dom domains of learning. One is knowledge and the purpose of these webinars around the year is to impart knowledge which will help you change your attitude to preserve a need. And then during the pre-conference workshop on 13 December at Lucknow, we'll be giving face-to-face uh, -face skill development program by way of drawing exercise, saw bone exercise and lectures. We all agree that the objective of the treatment are to conserve the knee for life. And with this, we have discussed role of lifestyle modification, weight control and exercise. And we have also learned about the success story of STO. This will help us to believe that TKR is an internal amputation and that's what not the goal should be. And in the same series today, we'll be learning all about TCVO. The main point is that TCVO is beyond alignment, which was taken as the king. Now stability is the main point. And the questions are, the TBL condylar valgus osteotomy, what it is, who invented it, how to diagnose intraarticular deformity, what is the technique of TCVO, how to determine that second osteotomy is needed or not, what are the complications, and what are the results. And for this, we have Dr. Milan Chaudhary, who is director of center of Vizaro Technique at Akola, who is also Honorary Professor at Russian Gazaro Scientific Center for Restorative and Traumatology and Orthopedics at Kurgan. And he is the editor of International Journal of Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction. He is the most knowledgeable person on knee conservation in the country. And he has a vast experience of STO since 1991. He has done more than 400 cases of vocal dome osteotomy for STO by Lizaro. He has done more than 75 patients with fixator assisted plating for vocal dome STO. He has done more than 100 cases of medial open with high tibial osteotomy and more than 20 cases of distal femoral osteotomy. But the main passion he has now is with TCVO and FDCO, and he has the largest number of these series by a person out of Japan. His passion about teaching is evident by the fact that he organized first national STO conference at Jaslo Hospital in Mumbai 2011, when Dr. Koshino was invited and I had the privilege to attend that and uh, assist Dr. Koshino in preparation of his talks. Uh, courtesy Dr. Milin. Then last year he did first STO 360 
And this year also, he is planning to do it on 1st to 3rd December at Akola. He has exclusive publications for STO uh, about dating in, uh, dome osteotomy in medial compartment OA, knee. Are different STOs needed for uh, as per location and severity of deformity? New measurement for intra articular STO, which gives us an idea about the need for ECVO. Then focal dome condylar osteotomy with one intra articular and extra articular osteotomy. Intra articular STO does adding second extra articular osteotomy help and role of this arrow fixator in STO. He is given orations out of which prestigious presidential lecture of Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction Society in North America. He has given Dr. Kulkarni oration and Asami in Pune 22 and Japanese Association Limb Reconstruction and External Fixators Association in Japan last month. He has been awarded gold medal um, in the name of Dr. K.S. Masala Wala of Wairoch in 2021 at Mumbai. And the topic was changing the, choosing the right STO based on location severity of the deformity. After this, we have panel discussion of, for which we have Dr. Mangal Parihar, who is the advisor of IOA Knee Preservation Subcommittee. He has a special interest of external fixator, infection control, complex fracture, non-unions, deformity corrections, beside giving solutions for OA need. We have Dr. Ajit Patel uh, from Vadodara. He has special interest in Xaro techniques, application in restorative traumatology and deconstructive orthopedics, including TCVO. And we have Dr. Joseph from Chennai, he's head of arthroscopy and sports medicine, Asian Orthopedic Association in Chennai, and he's been a former consultant with the um, premier Indian Super League football clubs. We have Dr. Dinesh Thakkar, another panelist who is the Joint Secretary of IOA, and he is the member for this committee also. And Dr. Ajit Sagal is away, so he's not be joining, and I am the with you as a chairperson. Now we will request Dr. Hacker to give us a word of wisdom as he is from the association with us. Over to Dr. Hacker for his kind words of wisdom. Good evening, everybody. And I am very happy that uh, apart from IOA post, I am a member of IOA Knee Preservation Subcommittee. And uh, we all uh, aware, we all uh, even uh, ex uh, on the panelist and uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, who is my mentor. Dr. Mangal Pariyar is also my mentor and uh, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi, he himself is very much interested in knee preservation. Probably, I must say it's a passion for him to preserve the knee and uh, we, should, uh, we should try our level best to uh, make the young orthopedic surgeons aware that knee can be preserved because young, uh, young orthopods are, has many doubts that whether we can preserve it or not. Uh, this is a good effort by Dr. Sanjay Rastogi by organizing a series of uh, webinars uh, to uh, make the all orthopedic surgeon aware that we can very well preserve the knee joint in osteoarthritis. Now, it's all uh, I would like to hand over to the uh, uh, chairperson, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi. Please continue. Thank you, Dr. Thakkar, for your kind words. Uh, now, I request Dr. Milin Chaudhary. Uh, to give his talk on TCVO, Dr. Milin Chaudhary.
Yeah. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi, for your very kind invitation to give this um, interesting talk. I'm I'm honored, and I'm very grateful for this opportunity that the Indian Orthopedic Association and the Knee Preservation Subcommittee has given me. I'm grateful to Dr. Dinesh Thakkar, who's the secretary of the Indian Orthopedic Association. I'm particularly grateful to Mangal Parihar and to Dr. Clement Joseph, both giants in their own right, in the Western and the Southern parts of our country, with tremendous experience and a wealth of knowledge. I'm humbled and honored that you have agreed to be panelists on this talk. Uh, really, so there comes a point in time in our careers where we have to open our minds. And such a point in time came to me in the year 2014, when I presided Hello. Over... Hello. In, um, when, uh, when I conducted the Asami International Conference and Professor Teramoto from Japan with his retinue of uh, great surgeons came from Japan and for the first time in an entire section devoted to high tibial osteotomies, gave this fantastic talk on the TCVO. Many of us were falling out of our chairs. Some of us were incredulous. Some of us were frankly laughing because he showed a 90-year-old person jumping after the osteotomy. And, uh, you know, in his characteristic, easygoing manner, he said, yes, yes, you can laugh because a lot of people laugh and they see this for the first time. Now, the truth of the matter is having seen him many times, having visited his center in, in Japan and having performed these surgeries for the last now close to nine years, I think the TCVO is probably going to have the last laugh. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Now, the thing about us, all of us surgeons who perform high tibial osteotomies is that we love to perform a single type of procedure. We love to perform the same procedure again and again. And that's not without a reason. That's for a very good reason. And that reason was elaborated upon by none other than Jackson and Waugh, who in 1962 wrote up this wonderful paper on 226 high tibial osteotomies. We associate their name with only the closing wedge, but the truth of the matter is, as you can see in the diagrams below, as you, as you can see in the diagrams below, they perform many different types. But at the end of the paper, in summary and in conclusion, they mentioned that it is clearly important to discover which operation is most easily carried out and has the least risk of complications. So keeping this in mind, all of us tend to fall in love with one procedure, spend a lot of time trying to discover its vagaries, its intricacies. So starting from, let's say, Mark Coventry in Rochester in Mayo Clinic, who started talking about the closing wedge and did it for many years till he gave it up because of poor results, because he used very poor implants. Or later on, they were improved upon by Tomihisa Koshino from Yokohama, who used a special angle blade plate fixation, did a lot of calculations, created oblique sliding holes to allow the osteotomy to collapse, used dual plating, also performed this specialized operation in which he allowed the patients to sit, he could resect osteophytes, and he called it a total knee without the replacement prosthesis. It's a big surgery, and I watched him perform the surgeries on his home turf. And it was a master craftsman at work. And I pay my obeisances to his memory. He passed away a couple of years ago. May his soul rest in peace. Opening wedge osteotomy too has had proponents like Philippe Ernigou, who after Debaye have now been performing this for the last 50 years. And for more than 4,000 cases that they have done, they're very much in love with this procedure. And that's the only high tibial osteotomy they have performed. Similarly, the dome osteotomy popularized by Paul, Paul Mackay became very popular that too in India and had many adherents. 
Thereafter, as a consequence, the focal dome, conduct, focal dome osteotomy popularized by Paley, none other than Paley, and in his write-up in 1994, and, with, and all these articles that he wrote became very popular. And I must admit, I'm equally guilty of this monotheism. I performed the focal dome osteotomy with the Elizaro, with the Elizaro for the first 15 years exclusively for more than 400 cases. I think it had a lot of versatility and it could do a lot of things. So, you know, then came Maurizio Catani who uh, enabled, you know, the spread of this technique by simplifying it. And uh, much credit goes to him for teaching a lot of people and he remains a beloved teacher. So the opening wedge osteotomy was then, you know, Dr. Sanjay Rastogi has visited this great man, Alex Tobley, whose shagird he has been and has performed wonderful things. Professor Alex Tobley is the one who really popularized and took it to the next level with Lobenhofer and colleagues, also some colleagues from Japan. And now what we see is that 95% of all the osteotomies describe only the medial opening wedge. And sometimes some people perform only the medial opening wedge as a hemicalotasis. Then recently the trend has come about the femur and tibia double level osteotomy starting from the work of Babis and Saragaglia. This is as way back as 2002 from Mayo Clinic because they wanted to retain the joint line obliquity and that's what they've been doing consistently for the last 22, 23 years. So there is a trend here. You know, this is the double level osteotomy and then came the intra-articular osteotomy which you will be surprised this is Professor Takashi Matsushita, who was the president of the Japanese, you know, the Asami International Kyoto Conference, which he held, I think, in the year 2006. And I heard him remark in the Asami International 2011 in Thessaloniki, 2012, that there is no need for any other osteotomy other than an intra-articular osteotomy. So what we have here is a series of surgeons who have been propagating and performing only one type of osteotomy consistently for 15, 20 or more years. And now, is that a good thing? Let's see. So here is, after all, Sukasa Teramoto was not the inventor. Um, Ko Chiba, Professor Chiba from Nagasaki was the inventor whose colleague was Professor Sukasa Teramoto. He's also the inventor of the DTO, the ankle osteotomy. And he's written up this first thing in the JLLR in the year 2015. Credit must be given to the one person we all know who did not believe in monotheism and he wrote about a la carte osteotomy, choosing the right high tibial osteotomy based on the location and severity of deformities. So taking a clue from the literature and from my experience, this is a recent editorial that I had the privilege to write. And this is the line of thought that I have been taking for the last six or seven years. Do we need different high tibial osteotomies depending upon the location and severity of the deformities? And the answer is a very resounding yes. We know medial compartment osteoarthritis, the patients present to us with mild, moderate, severe, and grotesque deformities. So the question that really begs to be asked is does one size fit all? The mechanical axis deviation on a full length X-ray goes from mild, moderate, severe to really horrendous. And again, can a single osteotomy do justice to all of them? These are our Indian patients from the hinterlands, also from the metropolises, anywhere, everywhere. These are our Indian patients. So one HTO cannot solve all these problems. So we came across this time to study our osteotomies for the last so many years, 32 years. I've been performing four different ones, now five ones. The first, as I said, 15 years, I did only the focal dome Elizar, which is very versatile. It uses the versatile Elizaro fixator. It uses a dome focal dome osteotomy, which is theoretically correct, which allows us to correct large virus deformities, maintain the bony contact, you know, along with the fibular osteotomy, perform a lot of compression. So not a single osteotomy has gone into non-union. Patients are mobilized quickly and they can get back to work in double quick time. Then of course, from the year 2002, the medial opening wedge became popular and it became available to us, us somewhere in the year 2009, 2010. And I have had done my share. And now finally, I'll be speaking about these two, three different types. One is this, the TCVO, the principle of which is that there is a teeter-totter in the joint. And by performing an L-shaped osteotomy and elevating the medial condyle, we're able to reduce the teeter 
or the instability on the joint in the joint and the an added version of which i have added on since the last equal in eight and a half years is the combined double osteotomy which combines a tcvo with a second distal extra articular osteotomy which enables us not only to correct the intraarticular deformity but also to do justice to the extra articular osteotomy in keeping with the principles that we have all held dear for the last 30 plus years about also trying to maintain the alignment so here is a very brief summary of that procedure which shows a large deformity you can see the l-shaped intraarticular and an extra articular fixed with the elizaro which allows us gradual and accurate correction to give us the desired result of stability as well as alignment now the question is there was less literature so how did we choose so we did a lot of calculations and you know we more than 15000 of these calculations on 161 knees and we used the classic radiographic parameters to characterize the deformities into three types the coronal plane varus is the primary deformity measured by mad measured by mpta measured by mldfa and measured by hip knee ankle angle the second one that's less known and that is the topic of today is the secondary deformity or the intraarticular deformity this is measured by chiefly two angles the condylar plateau angle which delineates the angle that the two tibial condyles make to each other and in their extreme form resemble a pagoda so it's called a pagoda tibia and then the second one is the more familiar joint line convergence angle which is a tangent to the lower femoral and upper tibial joint surfaces which designates that there is a laxity on the lateral side that we are aware of and the third variety also that most of us are not aware is that high tibial osteotomy is needed when there are tertiary deformities three of them that's the tibial variations of the tibial slope either bony or a fixed flexion deformity of the knee that's sagittal plane then comes the axial plane many patients come to us with either the limb that is short and in varus or the limb that is longer and in varus and then the rotational deformities which is very common due to intorsion of the tibia there's excessive intorsion which contributes to the deviation of the mechanical axis we also take into consideration knee and ankle joint line orientation like so in taking a decision which osteotomy is best then of course we come to the clinical examination in which we palpate very specifically for tenderness and rule out lateral joint line tenderness to ensure that a high tibial osteotomy can be done the more important aspect for the intraarticular the second variety is to find the excess mediolateral laxity in full extension which can be recorded also during gait as a lateral thrust and also recorded under the c arm under anesthesia to clearly show excess laxity under anesthesia in full extension and that remains the cornerstone of determining now looking at fixed flexion deformities and torsion is also the key and can never be forgotten so we created this algorithm as i said this is just an introduction because we we want to get a broad overview not just narrow in onto a type of osteotomy and decide that that's the only one we're going to perform so the primary deformity is the varus which is um, which may be either small or large if it's a small deformity without an intraarticular and without a tertiary deformity we can very well perform an opening wedge correction so the medial opening wedge high tibial osteotomy is ideal only for the small varus deformities without additional secondary and tertiary this is how now i relegate the medial opening wedge to the next in line comes the focal dome osteotomy of which i am very fond of which is very useful for the large varus deformities in which there is no intraarticular deformity but there is a significant component of a sagittal axial or rotational deformity and that can very easily be corrected by the focal dome the focal dome can allow you to correct the rotation it can allow you to perform lengthening it can also allow you to perform shortening because the long leg arthritis is also a very well known phenomenon and you can do this and hence the focal dome osteotomy remains one of my favorite osteotomies in the presence of this combination of deformities now let's come to the tcvo you can have either a small or a large varus deformity in the presence of an intraarticular deformity which we have already spoken about but without the tertiary deformity then the patient is a candidate for tcvo and if the deformity of the varus is very large there is a secondary intraarticular deformity and there is a tertiary deformity as well then what do we do 
we add the Elizaro fixator so that we can perform a combination of intra-articular and extra-articular and do both of them. This is the TCVO with the EAO. And this is the entire algorithm which explains the broad field that we are talking about. Now, we all know the MOWHTO, which is an extra-articular EAO. It does wonderful for small deformities, for middle-aged ladies. And this is the focal dome Elizaro, which is also an extra-articular deformity which can correct large deformities, intorsion, length issues, and for younger people and those who have got resilience and strength who can easily manage the Elizaro, this is a great idea. Now let's come to the TCVOP that's fixed with a plate, which is the pure intra-articular. This is, this is the lady on her left side, you can see, and there's a mild varus deformity, which has been reasonably well corrected. And the intra-articular deformity of the sloping condyles has been corrected like this. And finally, like I told you, the combination of these. So now coming in detail to the TCVO, what the mind does not know, the eye cannot see. So first you have to understand what is this concept and how to diagnose the intra-articular deformity. Clinically, we diagnose it when we see a large virus deformity. We see a dynamic virus or a lateral thrust in gait when the patient walks into our cabin, in my cabin. My consulting chamber is large, chiefly for the reason that I need to see these patients walk with their dress raised and I can see their entire thigh and I can judge the lateral thrust. And we can find out medial lateral laxity even on clinical exam in the outpatient department. And this I have shown before, this is the lateral thrust. This is the medial lateral laxity under anesthesia recorded on the CM. Now, radiologically, you suspect an intra-articular deformity when you see a large mechanical axis deviation. So if the MAD is close to zero, then we are not just automatically jumping to double level osteotomy, but we are going to think of the presence of an intra-articular, which is, which is made certain and the doubt and the suspicion is made certain with seeing the JLCA raised more than five degrees and the condylar plateau angle which is more than three degrees of depression of the condyle, minus three degrees. So when you have this large deformity like this, a large mechanical axis deviation, when you have a large joint line convergence angle, and when you have a large condylar plateau angle, that's when you should suspect that, hey, this is a different animal, and the medial opening wedge is not going to cut it. And you may do a double you know, level osteotomy, but then you're going to violate the you know, the principle of the Occam's razor, you're, you're, that's overkill. So you can do all that in a single stage, in a single osteotomy, because you diagnosed it. Now, some references. The very first paper by Professor Teramoto, who graced the first issue of the JLLR, he called it the controversy of HTO. And this is a paper from 2016 from AOTS. This is by Ko Chiba, the son of Professor Goji Chiba the originator, the, you know, the original group wrote up about the TCVO and a small group of their results. So there is some literature, albeit a, li a little on the lower side. So the intra-articular osteotomies, as I'm showing you, here is the L-shaped intra-articular osteotomy fixed with a plate. And here is a combination of intra and extra-articular osteotomy. So now how do we decide that the large deformity suspects or points to? So we, you know, we did a study several years back in which we checked 118 limbs, 59 patients. We had four observers on two different occasions. And we found that when the mechanical axis deviation is even lesser than 10% of the width of the tibia, it points to an increased correlation with a high JLCA. So the cutoff is not just a 0% MAD, even as low a deformity as 10% width of the tibia mechanical axis deviation, you're likely to have an increased JLCS. 0.66 Pearson's R correlation. Now there are several other articles that have also come, one from several other Japanese authors, like also from Chiba's Institute. This is from Higuchi. The comparison of the X-ray features of comparing the TCVO with the HTO. So you, you can tell which, you can tell the two beasts apart and several of these articles. Of note is this article by Professor Kuwashima from Tokyo, which was published in the JEO, which is a sister publication of the Kista journal. They refused to publish our article on intra-articular osteotomies 
but published this article by Kowashima in the JEO, which has, I think, a submission charge of more than 2000 euros. And they tried to brand the intraarticular osteotomy as an experimental surgery, even though this osteotomy is being performed since 1989 in Japan, in Nagasaki, in Koryama, and several other places. So now, before we get into dive into the subject, into the meat and the substance of the subject, the intraarticular deformity speaks and tells us of the presence of a different kind of instability, not the post-traumatic instability of youngsters whom you have an ACL tear, PCL tear, posterolateral corner, so on and so forth, which is what we are familiar with today and not the classification of Frank Noyes of Cincinnati who gave us this type 1 virus, type 2 virus and type 3 virus. This is a different instability that comes from degeneration, that comes from an osteoarthritic joint. There may or may not be a history of some minor or moderate trauma in the middle age or the old age. And the key to determine this is to find excess movement in full extension. I beg to differ with a lot of authors. I don't think it's a great idea to test it in 10 degrees of flexion or 20 degrees of flexion as some articles have done because the knee has to have some extra mobility in 10, 20 and more degrees of flexion to allow all the kinds of actions that we perform, such as sitting cross-legged, such as being able to, you know, have malleability. So look for excess movement in full extension and be aware that this is not the kind of instability that your arthroscopic surgeons, your friends, my friends, the arthroscopic surgeons are talking about. It's a different instability. So <clears throat> having said that, you have a large mechanical axis deviation and excess teeter totter on the AP view. So we perform a vertical and a horizontal limb. And what this does, it doesn't eliminate the instability, it reduces it. And what it does is frequently, it cannot correct the alignment to the entire extent. However, as I shall try to prove, hopefully, that that's not the end and that's not something to get tremendously dissatisfied about. And this is what the, after the opening, this is what the L-shaped osteotomy looks like. And the condylar plateau angle, which is rather large, reduces and comes very close to zero. So let's take a look at some. This is a retired doctor from somewhere in the central India. He's had a high tibial medial opening wedge done by me several years ago. You can see the excess correction, but he's completely free from symptoms, which is what I say. You can overcorrect with a medial opening wedge and don't worry about the KJLO in the very old people who don't have a lot of demands from their knee, it'll do well. And in this knee, you can see he has this kind of a picture. And these are the pictures of the TCVO. This is a central midline incision. And I always you know, try to release the patellar retinaculum. So it goes up to the patella. And these are the two guide wires that help us go towards the center of the knee at the intracondylar notch. And the vertical and the horizontal limb of the osteotomy is being created like this. And you can see on the left, the vertical limb is separated, horizontal not so much. And now the spreader separates this. What this does is it elevates the medial condyle and reduces this condylar plateau angle and reduces the teeter totter. And here are some pictures. When we pass in a guide wire, which is the hinge protection wire, you can see it's curving now as we open up. And these are some devices that we use from any of our trays, the Elizaro or the LRS tray, anything that prevent the you know, condyles from spreading. So as Dr. Sanjay Rastogi, my dear friend and elder brother has been telling me, I'm hoping to elaborate on some aspects of surgical technique. And here you can see this L-shaped osteotomy is very beneficial because you're going through hard bone and it allows the spreader to give you a good grip on that fragment to elevate it without crushing osteoporotic bones, which are very common. And here is him. Um, I hope this video is gonna work. This is his preoperative can see the lateral thrust here on the right side and under anesthesia, dramatic, you know, in full extension. CR recording. Yes. This is, you know, after the osteotomy, they're just giving a valve thrust to open by the spreader. Yes, then. And, you know, the laxity is reducing. And here is his result with the TCVO. You can see here, as I will point out several times, that in many instances, we are not able to correct the mechanical axis 
to beyond 42%, to beyond 45%, 48%, sometimes 50%. Sometimes we can go beyond that for various reasons. One is I'm afraid of overstuffing the joint. And there are many aspects to this technique, which I shall point out as we move along. And we can use the Tomofix plating system, which is wonderful. Or as I will point out later, there is this new system developed by the Japanese surgeons since many years, which is called the TRIS system, which they have got right and left plates for all kinds of osteotomies. But here what is happening is that the knee joint line orientation has not changed. The knee joint line orientation is 3.7, it's less than five. And the ankle joint orientation is maintained, it's less than a degree. And there is no teeter-totter remaining in the joint. There is a increased stability. Now, if you go back and look at his x-rays, if you look at this x-ray, you know, the condyles are slightly depressed. And in the post-operative phase, these condyles, what you can see is these edges of the condyles have come up and the central part of the intercondylar eminence has come down, suggesting some indirect stretching and tightening of the cruciate ligaments. So this aspect about what happens to the shape of the condyles, we wrote up this as new measurements to determine changes after intra-articular high tibial osteotomy, in which we found out two different angles. First one we call the spine edge angle. We can measure it from the top of the tibial medial intracondylar eminence, or we could also take it from the notch, from the roof of the notch to the edges of the condyles. And the larger the deformity, the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the lesser is the complementary angle. And when we correct it, and then after the, you can see the plate, when the edges come up, then this angle reduces. That means here it is only 24 degrees, whereas here this was close to 32 degrees. And this is statistically very significant, we found in that paper. And here is the spine vertical distance, or you can also call it the notch vertical distance from the edges of the condyles. And that also, even though it seems like 1.7 mm, it's a significant amount statistically, and it is enough to push, pull down the intercondylar eminential area to tighten the cruciate ligaments. And also the improved bony stability of simultaneous contact of both the tibial condyles, the femoral condyles. And we know pressure is equal to force upon area. Now we are dramatically increasing the area of contact from a single point contact on the medial side to the entire tibial condylar area of the entire 60 to 70 to 80 mm width, except for the intercondylar area. So the force goes down and regeneration of the cartilage can begin. All right, so some examples here. Um, this is a lady, she, she's local. She has, um, you know, she has, um, um, uh, she has this, um, uh, she has uh, a large flexion deformity and varus on the right side, completely worn out medial compartment. And uh, you can see her gait is horrendous. You can watch her. And she's, she's miserable. She can hardly walk a couple of steps. Now, what we found in her right side was that the knee had no mediolateral laxity in full extension. And therefore we chose to perform a focal dome osteotomy, fixator assisted focal dome osteotomy, which is fixator assisted by the Ilizaro and fixed the dome osteotomy is fixed with the plate. This is a lateral translation of the dome osteotomy. A fibular osteotomy is a must. And also in the lateral X-ray, you can note that we have corrected the fixed flexion deformity by compressing more anteriorly with the Ilizaro fixator. So we have corrected the sagittal plane, the rotational plane, as well as the coronal plane, all three. There's no laxity, so there's not an intra-articular. And then on the opposite side, we found the laxity, and this is the TCVO we have done. These are the two guide wires that go up to the, in the intercondylar area. And this is the arthrodesis spreader that elevates the medial condyle. Then once we are done with the complete elevation, then we can, I used to pass in a screw also for additional stability if the plate doesn't go very high. And, you know, because the osteotomy, I want to keep it slightly lower than the place where we start the medial opening wedge. And here is this lady after both the surgeries, her mechanical axis is well corrected and she's walking fast. And uh, several years after the... Several 
surgery, she's you know, free from pain. And here is a diagram given to us by Professor Teramoto. If you have this teeter totter and you, the diagram on the left, if you have the teeter totter and you perform an extra articular osteotomy, what you have is a correction of the alignment, but the intra-articular alignment and intra-articular congruity is not restored and you still have the teeter totter. So what you need to do is address the deformity where it is found and address the deformity which is relevant, germane and the causative factor. So I remember the statement from, you know, the modern, the great man, modern great man today, Elon Musk. I'm also a fan. Of course, everybody loves to hate him. But he said, you know, results are not deterministic. Results are probabilistic. So we do not, just because there is a deformity in the femur and the tibia, just because you see the deformity in the femur and tibia, you cannot automatically go and do a double level osteotomy. You know, so results are, you cannot just perform large medial opening wedge without giving rise to some other problems. Just because somebody in Germany or somebody sitting in some part of the world is doing this, results are not deterministic. They are probabilistic and they depend upon variable factors. Now let's come to the really interesting part, okay? This is, this is going to get really interesting. Now TCVO, this lady, elderly lady done about nine years ago, she, she got correction up to 45% of the axis. She's doing well. This is a modest correction of the MAD, adequate correction of the CPA, JLC. Did not correct, over correct the MPTA to more than 94 you know, degrees. So the TCVO really corrects the moderate virus and the intra-articular deformity as well, but it cannot correct the tertiary deformities. And on an average, we found in all our TCVOs, it doesn't exceed 45%. So it became a cause for concern. So the action we are trying to understand is, is congruent contact and stability more important than just alignment? The question, firmly tongue in cheek, is alignment dethroned? But more seriously, what if the mechanical axis remains uncorrected? Do we need to do more? This is the question I asked myself. I spent some sleep. I'm sorry about this squiggles on the screen here. Please ignore. So when to add a second osteotomy? I instinctively understood this. And as early as the year 2015, I started adding a second osteotomy because I was seeing that I'm not able to correct through a single intra-articular osteotomy without having to perform very large soft tissue releases. But the recent article from Kuwashima and an article from Korea and Japan pointed to this, that when you draw the alpha 60, that's the um, angle that's needed to correct the mechanical axis to 60%, which we call alpha 60. If that is greater than the varus JLCA, plus the valgus JLCA, the valgus JLCA is denoted as a negative into 1.5, then there is a need for a second osteotomy. And the second osteotomy here again in a formulaic manner, alpha 60 is greater than virus minus valgus into 1.5 than we need. So when do we perform a second osteotomy? And how can we perform a second osteotomy? I'll, um, so it can be a closing wedge, an opening wedge or a distal dome osteotomy. I've tried all of these and I'll tell you about this. So in this lady on the opposite side, uh, I, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm getting irritated by these squiggles that came. I don't know how. So I'm going to take just a moment to figure this out. I don't know why it's showing up on the screen, but uh, uh, so I, I, I added the you know, it's from minus 38%, we added in the same tomofix plate, we fixed it a little lower, added a second closing wedge osteotomy on the lateral side and managed to go all the way up to 46%, which I think is fairly good. And here is this lady almost eight years after the surgery, you can see her limbs are slightly in, still in virus, but she's completely and totally free from pain. And that is because the instability- has Menin, your screen is not seen. Okay, now I need to go back and uh, share screen. Here we are. I'm so sorry. We shall start again from this part. So here is this lady. So we added the second osteotomy, you know, above the, below the D hole and above the hole number one of the long shaft. 
and she got 46 percent access and nine eight and a half years after the surgery she's remarkably free from pain even though the deformity still looks like it's persisting and even though i'm happy with the results i'm uncomfortable because you know you can't teach old dogs like me new tricks and you cannot divest yourself of the postulate and of the compulsion of trying to correct alignment so we also try to add in an opening wedge osteotomy you can see the steps of the surgery this is a tcvo in which from the lower end we have performed the standard medial opening wedge and you know we have managed to get some better correction but i'm not entirely happy because it's a lot of hardware these are small people with small very badly bored tibia and it becomes very iffy so therefore in the year 2015 i chose to perform tcvo with an extra articular dome the principle i have already elaborated quickly to run through the large deformity with the teeter the first is the tcvo with an l-shaped osteotomy it's elevated and fixed with the half pins it reduces the teeter then we add intermediate pins and perform a distal dome osteotomy about an inch and a half inch and a quarter below the tibial tuberosity and that allows us to completely correct the mechanical axis as and when needed now this is not entirely new we borrowed from the principles i i am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon as well this is an example of a blounds child i did several blounds children i do you can see this large intra and extra articular deformity this is the hemi plateau depression so we elevate the hemi plateau fix it with screws and then add the second osteotomy and dramatically correct it with a dome you can correct a really large deformity like this child and voila it's completely corrected and this is where we sought inspiration from i've been doing this for the last 30 years also of course there is this article by Rod paley so this is not an entirely new concept just in some cases we have applied now watch this lady really large deformity and a pagoda tibia lateral thrust while walking what do we do for her so we put on we do the tcvo you can see over here the tcvo with the step and then at a distance of about three and a half to four centimeters a distal dome osteotomy well seen on this x-ray we don't want to overstuff the joint and the rest of the correction can be performed through the diaphysis to give her the desired result and a completely straight limb without instability and without pain she remains i think close to four and a half or five years after surgery actually this is the first lady we did she's 65 she's hardy she's very hardy and she could easily you know tolerate this this is the this is the diagrammatic representation and this is her fixator and in hardly two and a half months she united and we could get her mechanical axis to 60 and her cpa and jlc also were reduced so she was very happy and she was surprised because everybody had told her to go for a total knee replacement so on and so forth so then we looked at this question a little skeptically it's good once in a while to be skeptical of what you're doing and i am forever skeptical is a second osteotomy really worthwhile and i found as dr sanjay has told me that one of my briefs is to also present complications with the elizaro fixator sometimes it becomes problematic i had i'll tell you what problems i had one lady who's 50 and oh, i think 48 and was on oc pills and didn't tell us she developed a dvt one page and the same lady developed a, a, a drop of ehl which is miserable and i'm not happy with it one patient developed a very deep pin track infection in the distal pins not near the knee joint which required a debridement and uh, another patient the father of one of my fellows he had both sides the tcvoi he fell down from the bed developed a tibial tuberosity fracture and you know the fixator had to be extended above and some patients now i i would not do this for elderly ladies i would not use this method for elderly ladies and i'm reluctant because i've never done it the i i gave up the elizaro high uh, you know focal dome after the year 2004 in elderly ladies so then what is the solution anyway so i wrote up this in the journal of clinical orthopedics and trauma this was curated by the professor from king's college so now so some steps of this surgery while we are at it please um, you may so this is a combination of the intra and extra articular you can see this very obese man is 58 really large deformity uh, 
Now this is a lateral thrust. And here your posterolateral you know, complex is not gonna play a role. So this is miserable. His you know, TC wave is not gonna be enough, even though he has a large intraarticular instability recorded on the C arm, like so. So we start, we have to do the fibular osteotomy. This is one of one instance where we have to do this. And then we add the distal block of two rings first, you know, then we got a handle on the distal fragment. Then we do the patellar retinacular release and I harvest the osteophytes. You know, I would like to stop here for a moment and I like to harvest the osteophytes for two reasons. The less important reason is to fill up the gap. The more important reason is why do osteophytes form? If you read the book by Bombelli on osteoarthritis of the hip, he has explained why osteophytes form. All of us know this, that osteophytes are a method used by the body to aid stability of the joint. And since we are going to provide stability, we don't want, that's one aspect. But the second aspect is that the osteophytes on the medial side and the lateral side are tending the collateral ligaments. And we are forced to release more of the medial superficial medial collateral ligament, which I don't want to do. And hence I release the osteophytes. I find that the laxity increases. So I have to perform less of a release of the superficial MCL. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, the anterior cortical cut is started. We drill the posterior cortex in line for the vertical cut. We use osteotomes carefully and the CM. The intracondylar area is the place where most people are very worried what's going on with a very carefully tangentially directed C arm view in the lateral. We con continue to check every blow of the osteotome that we are not penetrating beyond a millimeter or so. We don't damage the ACL or the PCL. And here the curved medial cut is marked with an osteotome. We drill the posterior cortex like so, and we continue the medial cut. And this is a combination I use a curved cut sometimes and I go a little more laterally and in this case, it didn't open up. So I redid the posterior cut a little bit. Then the hinge protection wires came on. And then we used manual valgus force and then a spreader. And we opened up till the medial condyle made contact and we could find a reduced instability, reduced mobility. So then we fixed this part of the osteotomy with two half pins, lateral and medial and then a CC screw as well. And the spreader is maintaining the opening, the osteophytes grafts go in. The distal osteotomy is drilled beneath the two holes. The tunica is out. Now we complete the assembly of the Elizaro fixator. I think the Elizaro is very versatile. The dome osteotomy is translated laterally because it dramatically helps in shifting. Look at him, up and about second day, Mechanical axis, 57% intra-articular osteodeformity is reduced, is walking, and the lateral thrust is eliminated. So this is a good candidate for this procedure. He has to be hardy and not very old and not lady. So this is the surgical technique of the combination of TCVO and the extra-articular. Now, the results. We found that we could reduce by adding a second osteotomy, the JLCA nicely reduced from nine to about less than four degrees. And uh, the condylar plateau angle reduced from more than 10 degrees on an average to less than two degrees. That's the intra-articular component. And by adding the extra-articular osteotomy, I could go from an average of minus 23, see how large these deformities are to an average of 59.7, close to 60%. And this is the entire range of some you know, study we did some time back when I was presented in ESCA, the, you know, the, in, in Madrid in the year 2019, this was a selected paper, it was published over there. So the combination of these two osteotomies allows us to correct the severe virus, the intra-articular component and the tertiary deformity, primary, secondary and tertiary, all are correct. Now, what is not yet clear, and this is not the end of the presentation. There are two aspects to the presentation remaining. What's not yet clear, this is me, skeptically speaking, I am, I remain a clinical scientist. I'm not a superstar. So we still don't know perfectly what's the end point in TCVO. 
because we know there is a creep phenomenon. And if we wait a little longer and a little longer, we may get a little more creep. But will we cause overstuffing? Will it change the kinesiology and the range of motion of the joint? These are questions to which some answers and some direction has been found. Will it help to have a CT scan? Can we do more sophisticated image analysis like evaluating shape modeling? The most important, how much to release the superficial MCL? Now we are at loggerheads, the HTO group with the arthroplasty group. The arthroplasty group doesn't want to touch the superficial MCL and we cannot perform a medial opening wedge without releasing it. Now, what I have found is that if you resect the osteophytes, then you are able to release less of the superficial MCL, which retains the stability. So just like some great arthroplasty surgeons are fond of saying that it's really a soft tissue surgery, truth be told, I think even the TCBO or high tibial osteotomy is really a surgery of soft tissue balancing. So the osteophyte harvest, will it, it will help relax the deep MCL, release, reduce the need for superficial MCL release. And the query is, the query is, so I judiciously continue to perform the combination of osteotomies, but the question is, if we leave it with the TCVO at 45%, will it really reduce the long-term results? And the question is the second osteotomy redundant. But now with your permission, this is not the end of the presentation. What I will do with your permission is I will close this presentation and go on to the next one, which is because this is in this presentation is in three parts to make it easy, and uh, you know the second the second aspect of this is going to deal with um, the latest version of the uh, is the focal dome condylar osteotomy. Now, having shown you a combination of TCVO and extra articular. We came across this article in the year 2020 from Kanazawa University, which talked about the focal dome condylar osteotomy, which is an elegant two-in-one solution with a minor deviation from the TCVO, or that was my interpretation of it. And this is, I've fallen in love with this surgery and for reasons which will become apparent very soon. So this was written up by Igarashi and the great professor Suchia from Kanazawa University. This is from the article in which what he does is the TCVO, the vertical limb of the osteotomy is medial to the patellar ligament. Here, the vertical limb is lateral to the patellar ligament. And instead of making a straight or an oblique downward facing cut, they make an upward curving cut. What it does is a couple of things. It retains bony contact. Now we are simultaneously improving the congruity of the joint as well as due to this curved cut, like the focal dome, this is the focal dome condylar, we're getting a large correction. And we don't have to do a fibular osteotomy and fix it with a plate. I fell in love with this and I'll tell you why. This is a lady doctor from a neighboring city, much respected. She has minus 5% MAD and the alpha 60, you can't do a medial opening wedge, it's 16 degrees. I don't want to do any more than nine or 10 degrees medial opening wedge for the last many years now, for various reasons, especially in short ladies with small tibiae. A varus JLCA is 11 degrees and a valgus JLCA is about three degrees. So 11 minus three into 1.5 is 12 degrees, but the amount of need, correction needed is 16. So therefore, theoretically, it should point to a second osteotomy, but we don't want to use a fixator. She's 72. So we did the focal dome condylar osteotomy which is a minor variation according to me. This is my interpretation. Actually, Professor Suchia devised this as a surgery which uses the exact cora at the lateral tibial spine. But my interpretation of this is that this is an improved version of the TCVO just to give a better alignment. So here it is, you can see the proximal wire. This is the jig that we are using to delineate the curved cut. And the important step is the passage of these wires which protect the very narrow part of the lateral tibial cortex to prevent them from refracturing. You can see these hinge protection wires Then the osteotomy opens up. And here is this lady. She's got mechanical axis deviation of 72%. And she's old, she's much older than her black hair suggests. And so she's going to happily and is happily tolerating the little overcorrection. 
and wonderful in a single osteotomy if we've managed to correct the intra and the extra articular. Younger lady, 45, large deformity like this. Again, she is not going to tolerate a fixator. So here is the, some steps. This is the guide wire that points to the cora. And here is the vertical cut lateral to the patellar ligament. You can see the very narrow zone here. And the osteotome is cutting out the narrow portion. We have passed the wires over here on the lateral side to stiffen up that fragment. And now we are able to you know, slowly open up and do the plating. And here she is. She's come close to 50% good correction of both the intra and the extra articular components. This is a lady, this is a, from, from, from Southern India, this large deformity like this and dramatic you know, lateral thrust. Of course, at hardly the age of 50, she's been advised a total knee, which is very reluctant to undergo, having her stories from her relatives. This is the significant lateral thrust. And uh, you know, here she is with the focal dome condylar osteotomy close to I think 40, 42% from coming from minus 36. You can see the large wedge that's been opened up. The osteophytes have been used as a graft. And she's, you know, this is close to a year after surgery. She's completely free from pain, has good function, is able to squat. Has also sit cross-legged. Somebody like this, I'll be showing you a video of this technique of the FDCO, large mechanical axis deviation like so you can see. And this is the end result. This is 60% mechanical axis achieved through a single osteotomy. You can notice the large triangular opening here and the good amount of bony contact which differs from the TCVO. So here is showing you the surgical technique of this version, the third variety of this. And this is the focal dome condyler which is a combination in a single osteotome. It's a large mechanical axis deviation minus 30%. The lateral thrust you can easily appreciate like so. And uh, you know, the alpha, three, alpha 60 is 18.5 degrees. The varus JLCA is almost 10, valgus JLCA is 1.8. And you're going to need a second osteotomy if you believe in that theory. But the laxity is a lot like this. And this teeter totter of the joint in full extension is dramatic. And uh, we need to address this. So the gentle medial soft tissue release, this is the pes ancillinus being released. This is the guide wire at the top with a very simple jig. And at the second wire delineates the lower extent of the osteotomy. You know, and we are starting out with a, I think a recip saw or something, you know. We can, you can use a recip saw, you can use, you know, you can use an osteotome. Then we go for the posterior and the intracondylar cuts like this very carefully under full C-arm control. And, you know, the, the, so it's got a curved medial cut and this lateral cortex protection wire is going in. We want at least two wires to stiffen up that fragment because it really becomes narrow and you can fracture this if they wait very early. And then the hinge protection wires, and then we make sure that the osteotomy is nicely opened up and it doesn't, you know, the posterior cortex because it, it requires some persistence and perseverance to clearly open it up nicely. And here we, with the valgus stress, you know, first comes the valgus stress, the spreader comes later and the spreader must go in beyond the posterior cortex. You can see the wires are curving up and the condyles are becoming collinear. Now we use the graduated spreader, just like you use it in MOWHTO. You can calculate the amount of opening with the mini achi method. Look at the dramatic opening like this. And here she is, improved into valgus. It's pain-free walking. The condylar plateau angle is zero. It's good contact, very little teeter-totter remaining and the mechanical axis is at 66%. And the knee joint line orientation is only 1.6, okay? She can sit cross-legged and she can walk fast and she has zero pain. So this is virtually a boon for a lot of middle-aged ladies who have these large deformities and 
you know, one more like this, large deformity, similar focal dome condyler, and we've reached up to 52%, like so, without dramatically altering the knee joint line orientation. A younger person who definitely not want to fixate a, a minus seven, the same as you can use a slightly different jig, use a recip saw or not. This is, you know, you can see this is lateral to the, uh, you can see we've gone lateral to the patellar ligament and that's the hairy part of the operation, I think. But she reaches close to 50% and has very good walking. And uh, we wrote this up last year and carefully analyzed our results using, uh, uh, and what I'm going to do now, uh, Sanjay, is I think yes. I have 10 more minutes. I'm yes. going to, yes, I'm going to give the final part of this presentation, which I think is a very thought provoking and most interesting aspect. Now, so far I have been talking about the different high tibial osteotomies and uh, the different high tibial osteotomy, uh, the intra-articular high tibial osteotomies. And now I want us to also think about what is happening in, um, you know, why are we being forced in the direction of, uh, you know, performing double osteotomies willy-nilly and compulsorily? Now, make no mistake, I love a challenge. I love learning new osteotomies like most of us. We all, I invested sufficient amount of time, energy, and material, and new equipment in learning how to do a modern distal femur, not with the Elizaro, which I've been doing for 30 years. And this uh, young fellow of mine really diligently worked hard and he did a lot of measurements about knee joint line. So I beg your indulgence. And this is, I think, a thought-provoking presentation. The question is, does knee joint line really matter? The question I raised in the previous part of the presentation is, does, is alignment the only thing? And here is KJLO really the thing. Now this started, this trend started not now, it started in the year 2002 by George Babis of the Mayo Clinic. He was the first one to talk about a method to retain joint line obliquity. I think it's got to do with the way in which they wanted to convert their total high table osteotomies to total knee. And look at the operation that he has done. Closing wedge, closing wedge. He shortens the limb. That's one aspect. But he did, he used computer-guided surgery. And then came, then came Dominique Saragaglia from Grenoble in France. And he's done more than a thousand of these computer-guided double-level osteotomies. I think it's, it comes from a compulsion of doing a total knee arthroplasty. And I may be wrong. I'm not an expert in that subject matter. Now, the question is, how much importance should we be giving to this one variable at all? But I would be mistaken if, if I were to say that these are not needed without having actually done these well and mastered some of them. So he has this gentleman with a very large deformity, very bad, he's in pain. And, you know, so, you know, he's got deformity in the femur and tibia, large deformity. No, he doesn't need this. He doesn't need that. He needs a double level osteotomy. Okay. So he got a closing wedge femoral osteotomy. And then we found that he's got an excess mediolateral laxity. So we did a TCVO. So he got a double level osteotomy. And here he is. He's got a fantastic result. And on the opposite side, later on, I have done another surgery. He actually got a focal dome fixator assisted plating on the other side. Now, now comes the nub. Now comes the grind. He is very old. He's 68. And after the first osteotomy, he had developed a large hematoma, you know, despite not being on blood thinners. And it took him a long time to recover. He's elderly. He's a low demand patient. And so his entire rehab period was spread out close to eight to 10 months. Now, I also done high tibial, you know, double level. Now, look at this another example. This is a lady done many years ago, large Boeing deformity. We planned this. This is a technique I wrote up. I'll tell you, this is a double level fixator assisted nailing for the femur to correct it very accurately. And then a TCVO. And similarly, on the opposite side, first the double level fixator assisted nailing and then a TCVO with an Elizaro, double level osteotomy. 
We wrote this up in the British Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, 2019. But she's got a fantastic result. But four different surgeries. It's a lot of time. So it's double or quadruple the number of surgeries, double the amount of expense or quadruple the amount of expense and much larger amount of time for the rehabilitation. So we start thinking. Now let's really analyze KJLO. How is it, you know, classified? How is it, you know, what is the e exact, you know, detailed description of KJLO? It's the inclination of tibial plateau with the floor in a bipedal stance, in an attention position with the feet close together and the mechanical axis adducted three degrees into varus. The knee joint line orientation is parallel to the ground and it is three degrees in valgus in relation to the mechanical axis in the upper outer quadrant. This is by definition. You look up Paley's book. This is the definition of knee joint line orientation. It comes from the arthroplasty people. It comes from the work of many great, I think from Krakow and from so many other Hungerford, David Hungerford from, you know, Johns Hopkins from long ago. This is hoary stuff. These are postulates. Now in a single legged stance, we are saying that when the patient walks with the limb close to the midline, the KJLO is parallel to the ground. Now, these are some of the things we have been told. And in a bipedal stance, when the patient is standing at ease, the mechanical axis is parallel to the vertical and the KJLO is three degrees inclined into valgus to the ground. This is what we've been told. This is the definition. Now, I've gone through the literature. We spent a lot of time and this young man and me, we spent days and days and days and we've spoiled our eyes doing measurements galore. And what did we find? How do we measure KJLO? Firstly, there's a lot of different articles which measure it differently. You either measure the bisector of the JLCA to the ground or you measure the inclination of the tibial plateau to the ground, which is going to give a different reading. Then you're going to depend upon M MPTA or you're going to depend upon the bisector of the JLCA with the mechanical axis which does not depend on the position of the limb when the X-ray is being taken. That's the advantage. So let's look at the bisector of the JLCA to the ground method. This is the you know, joint line. You draw the 50-50 line, you draw the center, and then you use a Cobb angle tool in your packs to find the joint line inclination to the ground. That's 7.1 in this particular case. Some people use the tibial plateau to the ground. Many articles are like this. I don't believe in this method. They have just used the tibial plateau like this and then found the joint line orientation. And the third is using the JLC bisector of JLCA with the mechanical axis. This is the mechanical axis. Take the bisector of the JLCA and then the mechanical axis and the bisector and the upper outer quadrant to measure this. And that's the third method. So now, the KJLO notation is if it's a varus that is it's inclined upwards going medial, it's a positive. And the valgus JLCA is negative if it's going upwards laterally. Okay. Now the problem is when you take full length x-rays, Sanjay, and I would definitely want Clement's opinion about this, is there's something we get called as apparent KJLO. And what we need to do is get derive the true KJLO. So how do we derive the true KJLO? Now the red line here denotes the mechanical axis and the blue line is the vertical that's been dropped from the center of the femoral head. So we came up with this formula, which is actually very simple. The true KJLO is equal to the V dash MAD. That is the angle between the vertical and the mechanical axis deviation plus three degrees plus the apparent KJLO. Now let's look at a few examples. Deriving the true KJLO. First, we take the apparent KJLO in this patient which is 0 0.4 degrees and the VMAD that's vertical to the mechanical axis deviation is 1.8 degrees. And here the mechanical axis is abducted in relation to the vertical. Okay. So the mechanical axis is lateral. The vertical from the center of the hip is more medial. Okay. We can draw the angle here or we can use a Cobb angle tool anywhere down the line. We can use a Cobb angle tool to find out what is the VMAD, VMAD. Okay. So now in this X-ray, when the mechanical axis is abducted, meaning that the red line mechanical axis is lateral to the vertical line. So this denotation of the VMAD is positive. So the true KJLO 
is derived by the vertical to MAD. You can see we've calculated here as 1.8 and the apparent KJLO is 0. Point, it's actually 0. 0.4. I'm so sorry. So 1.8 plus, you know, uh, I'm sorry, 1.8 1 plus 3 plus plus 0.3. So the true KJLO in this case is 5.1 degrees in Varus. Okay. Now let's look at this other scenario in which the mechanical axis is adducted to the vertical. You'll come across this. Here, this angle, the VMAD is negative. So it's adducted by 2.1 degrees. So the notation is minus 2.1. You can see it in the lower part of the screen. And the apparent KJLO we have found is 0 0.7. So we derive the true KJLO by minus 2.1 plus 3 plus 0 0.7 which we come to the true KJL of only 1.6 degrees of Varus. Similarly, like this, in this case, you can see the mechanical axis is more medial by 3.1 degrees. So what is the apparent KJL of 2.6 becomes a true KJL of only 2.5 degrees of Varus. And finally, in this example, where the mechanical axis is 4.6 degrees adducted to the vertical, the apparent KJL is 0.8, is sorry is is 2.4 over here 2.4 the true kjl is only 0 0.8 now we made more than 5000 measurements and over 12 years we we have done these sorry this got all jumbled up it's 190 osteotomies and what we found is that only in the focal dome elizaro the true kjl average exceeded 5 and in the, the third method of measuring the true KJLO, that's to the mechanical axis and the joint line orientation, bisector of the joint line orientation, which is supposed to be only three degrees, only in the TCVOI, we exceeded by close to a degree. So what are we getting at? What we are getting at, now it's time for us to think. What? We watch some patients walking. What's happening? This is a patient with a virus. He underwent a osteotomy. See what they're doing. They are abducting the limb while walking. Okay, the wide base stance of the osteoarthritic limb is there for a reason. Okay, another patient like this, another patient who underwent a surgery like this, you can see it's a slightly broad based gait compared to the line. They're not walking, adducting the limb to the line. Okay. Like this, this is a normal person, even a normal person, a very healthy person walks with some abduction. Okay, so it is not true and not necessary that the knee joint line orientation is as it is described in theory. Now, I'm very near the end, Sanjay, and I'm not yet done with an hour. I have only two more minutes I'm going to take and I'm going to get you all thinking. Look at this, this is a dramatic valgus because I treat deformities for the last 33 years. What is this chap with the valgus doing? He is compensating the valgus by adducting the limb. Okay, this is what they do. The another way in which they compensate is by externally rotating the limb if the deformity is large. So now the question begs to be asked, which is easier to compensate? A varus KJLO or a valgus KJLO? And finally, the literature, recent literature tells us the joint line obliquity does not affect the outcomes of HTO at an average 10 year follow. So I leave you with this conclusion that I have come to in my practice after a lot of study and after a lot of measurements. And I can tell you that my glasses, eye glasses have gone up by more than two number with all this reserve the distal femoral osteotomy only for a large deformity in a young high demand patient. Nakayama and Schroeter in Kista, deep inside the article, they have said our, in our unit DLO, the double level osteotomy is indicated when there is a combined deformity in an active patient population and the patient wishes to retain high levels of activity or to continue to sit in Vajrasana as, as is what we call as Vajrasana. So I leave you with a couple of points to ponder over. Firstly, 
all of us love to do a single type of osteotomy get very good at it for a good reason it's a good practice but can one osteotomy take care of all different patient problems the answer is no the second thing i want to leave you with how is to how to diagnose an intraarticular deformity how to you know which diagnostic modalities are there clinically how do you diagnose it and how do you treat it using the tcvo or a tcvo with an extra articular or a focal dome condyler and finally the question every time you see a large varus deformity the mechanical axis going zero and less and the mldfa is 90 91 92 you don't have to do the distal femoral osteotomy with an hto you can reserve it for the few patients with a single operation of the intraarticular osteotomy you can give the patient a good result i thank you so very much for your very patient hearing and for very kindly allowing me to elaborate on this very exciting subject that's keeping me all agog since the last several years thank you sir thank you all thank you very much dr mangal uh, milind milind name mangal here ha and milind as the speaker thank so you so i put the ball in the dr mangal's court to start the panel discussion and dr clement and dr joseph for and ajit i think great good exposition on uh... on on all the variety of you know approaches to uh, correcting the alignment especially important is the recognizing and uh, correcting the intraarticular component when you have a large deformity i also agree with what he was saying in terms of the uh, double osteotomy in that probably it is it is more geared towards um not creating excessive deformity in uh, in the tibia so the only issue is that if you are not doing a double osteotomy then you have to start thinking like what milin was uh, talking about where you have to carefully look at uh, what is the intraarticular um, component of it and when you find that you need to uh, correct that so i i agree with that part of it that 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 is geared more towards doing a future tkr um if required and therefore not damaging or not well not damaging not altering the uh, numbers or the angles for a future uh, tkr so then you have to start focusing more and more on um, the proper understanding of what is the alignment which i wonder uh, I, I, it will be probably a tough job to to get people who are not regularly doing realignment um, on board but yes we should continue looking at this and uh, expounding the the various uh, aspects of it Dr. Joseph, your comments, please. Yeah, first of all, uh, I thank uh, Sanjay and IOA for this wonderful uh, meeting. And nowadays in conference, we hear seven minutes talk, eight minutes talk. Very difficult to understand the concept, especially of a philosophy of how a person thinks. And today, it was um, it was an opening into how Dr. Milin approaches the patient uh, uh, situation. and it's very clear that uh, there are two levels of uh, osteotomy or maybe two types of osteotomy surgeons somebody like me who has been doing arthroscopy and also osteotomy i think we should know our limits but there are there exist a group of patients whose deformities are complex like intraarticular deformity deformity in more than one place and those set of patients have to be identified and um, assessed properly probably you got you got cut off yes 
you'll probably join back again. Meanwhile, uh, Dr. Ajit, your Ajit can... uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. And excellent. Uh, I'm a very, very impressive presentation by Melin, sir. And a uh, lot of technical aspects of measurements raised in this presentation. Uh, I'll let, try to highlight few points as regard to TCVO and FDCO. Uh, the TCVO osteotomy, the vertical limb goes right uh, through the almost, uh, say, uh, medial 80% of the patellar tendon. So almost 80% of the patellar tendon or 90% of the patellar tendon remains with the lateral condyle. And only 10% uh, of the tendon remains with the medial condyle, where FDCO is totally patellar tendon with the medial condyle. So one thing I'd like to ask of the Milan is uh, what happens to the torsion effect of the, because you said that FDCO is good for the tertiary thing. That is tertiary deformities when they are existing tertiary deformities. Uh, for primary and secondary TCO no, no, and for no, tertiary. No. May I? May I? No. Yes, sir. TCO is not meant for tertiary. Okay. The tertiary deformity can only be tackled with a second extra articular osteotomy. Okay. Okay, so it my really compensates for the large virus, which is and to give you better alignment than the TCVO. It's a TCVO with an okay. addition, it's not for okay. tertiary. Okay, so the my uh, point is like uh, what happens to the torsion of the tibia, which has happened in a moderate uh, or severe type of uh, uh, osteoarthritis where there's a lot of torsion, and this torsion the patellar tendon doesn't rotate externally if it is with the medial condyle. It is only the lateral condyle uh, which goes into valgus. So still the patellar tendon will go more to medially instead of it going laterally uh, in FDCO. So what happens to the torsion effect of the TBI? Yeah, actually, actually, actually you're right because in the principle of TCVO itself, a small amount of external rotation of the distal fragment is built in, in the yes. TCVO also. And in the FDCO, the entire patellar ligament doesn't stay with the medial condyle. We elevate it a little bit because to be collinear with the lateral tibial spine, you need to elevate the patellar ligament a little bit and suture it back. And we have gone as far as to put in a, you know, screw from the patellar, you know, tuberosity to prevent the, you know, the avulsion of the patellar ligament. It's not happened, but uh, so we, uh, quite a bit, say 80% of the but patellar ligament remains. And what we are doing is a primary aim is to improve the joint congruency by giving simultaneous contact, number one. And the second aspect is there is this little element of rotation that's added. So you are right, actually. It does address partly some of the rotational component of the intorsion. It's a little difficult to perform. And there is this nuance of when and how much to add the soft tissue release to be able to get more of this external rotation without creating an iatrogenic laxity. So um, I, I'll elaborate later, but I hope I'm answering something. Uh, uh, so can I continue with one more uh, uh, query on the subject? Please. Uh, the other thing, probably the issue now is coming up with the intraarticular osteotomy into the picture what exactly alignment we should uh, aim for. Like till HTO, it was Fujisawa point or anywhere between 55 and 60. So if you are doing intra-articular stabilization, what is the actual mechanical axis we are aiming for? Should we be aiming for the center of the knee, just medial to the knee, just lateral to the center of the knee? What exactly, or what is the probably what is it a constitutional alignment we should aim for or we should aim for a mechanical alignment standardized mechanical alignment i'll answer this question in a variety of ways firstly i'll try to paraphrase professor teramato case by case case by case case by case okay that's the way he likes to put it <laughs> and the second thing i want to disabuse you of this notion of constitutional virus i will beg your forgiveness my esteemed honorable panelists if I speak a little too much, I've never ever been able to digest this business of constitutional virus. I know this guy from Belgium in Christian University in Leuven, 
who is an Olympic sailor, came up with this article which he wrote in CORR in 2013, which won the Chitranjan Singh Ranawat Award. And then from there on, everybody is talking about this. It makes no sense to me because I cannot see the residual of the epiphyseal growth line in most of my patients. I refuse to understand it. I broke my head over it. I read the article many, many times. It has made no sense to me whatsoever. And this confusion about functional and anatomical and mechanical led the arthroplasty surgeons deal with their confusion. I want to have none of their confusion. Having said that, and with, you know, with, with a little firm tongue firmly in cheek, it's difficult to, you know, the thing is, I think we are all very mature orthopedic surgeons. And the days, I don't like this business of take home message, take home. No, you apply your mind. The, 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 you must, all of us orthopedic surgeons can apply our mind to the presence of mind. See, you can't achieve a lot of correction with a single osteotomy. You can't aim for that one point every single time because you may have to do a lot of soft tissue release. The shape of the upper tibia may be such that your plate is not going to fit in well, that you're going to overstuff the joint. There are nuances. And so the best possible when your condyles make contact and sometimes the mechanical axis is less than 50 and I've had to accept it. So I've made the efforts to modify that by various methods I've shown, but I don't think it's necessary for the thinking surgeon to be compelled to aim for a figure. Now, when we were doing with external fixation, when I was doing the focal dome with the Elizaro, my end point was not the Fujisawa, which is what I've been maintaining since 1993. I've been saying this. My end point is when the lateral thrust is eliminated. So I have frequently overcorrected and the patients have done well for 20 years, 25 years, many of them. So I don't believe in a single end point. I've never believed in a single end point. Initially, when the facility of the external fixator is there, we can correct till such time that the lateral thrust is overcome, which may come at 65, which may come at 70% or even less. And now with the TCVO, what the maximum soft tissue releases permit us to achieve and the efforts have been made just because I can't get over the alignment issues. So the efforts have been made in different directions with the FDCO with the additional, but not a single figure. And it's sometimes too much trouble to, you can't do the Elizaro for all of them. You can't do the Elizaro or the LRS or the Pitka's HTO fixator or any, any fixator. People don't want it. So many people don't want it. And the FDCO is a little hairy. So, you, I mean, patients are doing well in the medium term. I accept. It's the medium term, my experience. Clement uh, is back. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry that the connection got disconnected at yeah. the moment. So you can continue. Your, yeah. uh, it's a lot of uh, eye-opening uh, thoughts for a lot of us. And uh, I'm sure that uh, this part is not being discussed in the so-called osteotomy uh, sections of the knee meetings. It's slightly, I think, people who have taken up osteotomy should dig in deeper to uh, find out about this component. And also, it's very technical. I think unless somebody is dedicated to learn this thing, uh, how easy for, uh, uh, what is a learning curve with this osteotomy how many cases should we do to become competent? Uh, can you give us a ballpark, sir? Uh, that's that's a that's again very prescriptive, and I, I, since I'm not the industry and I have no 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 benefits from the sale of any of the plates or the devices, this thing about the un, unicondylar osteotomy can be done only by those who are doing 25 plus. I've read all these papers. But yes, I agree with, I understand what you're trying to get at. And uh, I think it's truly speaking, if you watch the videos again, per se, the technique is not that difficult. Getting used to performing the cuts in the intracondylar area, a little gingerly at the beginning of the posterior cortex deep down, where we are very fairly, you could be close to the neurovascular structures very carefully. Yes, the technique is difficult. You can't 
you can't be oblivious to the dangers and i have had my share of under correction of the deformities i have had my share of not being happy with what i did i have had two patients who were completely dissatisfied because i think that they probably just didn't have the congruity and they were probably better candidates for a total knee replacement some people are just not good candidates i would say 5% of people are just not good candidates for this and uh, i think it takes 5 to 10 cases minimum for for us to get a real good hang of it i'm sure i you know i'm sure you agree that even in the medial opening wedge when we first started doing the tomo fix it was not until we did a eight or 10 of them that we felt sort of confident that yeah you know i got it you know that we to for us to learn that the osteotomy is not to stop short 1 cm of the lateral cortex but we have to intentionally create a type 1 fracture so everything is technical you want to give the patient a good result you have to dig deeper so it took us it took me time to understand that and and it was due to sanjay's you know munificence his help he introduced me to professor stobley we had a one on one conversation in jaipur and that's when i came to know that's when he told me that's when i came to know so you know the the desire to know that so he said you know and he spoke about this in amdabad then dinesh you know dinesh had organized this conference in amdabad the first time around with uh, navin thakkar and you know alex stobley had come that he aims for the type 1 fracture so that it takes you time to know that because till then the literature spoke about stopping short by 1 cm and that was causing type 3 fractures going into the joint type 2 fractures going distal to the tibial head and creating more valgus instability despite having a tomo fix plate so it does take a while and i think 8 to 10 cases you start becoming comfortable and you discover more and it's um um but it's it's doable for experienced surgeons like you for surgeons who've done you know 30 40 50 a high tibial osteotomy is you could start looking at diagnosing and treating it with an intraarticular i think it's doable Milan, I'll just sorry. I let me just uh, extend his question a little bit. Out of a hundred patients that you would see who need realignment, how many of them would be a uh, you know you think require a classical HTO, and how many then require the additional? That's probably when when he was talking about you know people who are doing osteotomies limiting uh, themselves. I think that's what he was. referring to one is yes we need to recognize which are these patients but in your uh, personal experience how many patients you think are well served in uh, with with a regular realignment got it so i'll i'll paraphrase your question so patients don't come to me for realignment patients come to us for pain relief correct so what we are we have been taught and we are really thinking with with blinders is we are only looking at the alignment what we need to give them is relief from pain so it so happens coincidentally that i have in the last several years performed close to 60% to 70% of all osteotomies using the tcvo or its variants close to 70% or more because the suspicion clinically then you take a du- double level x ray then you take a single legged stance x ray then you sometimes examine an anesthesia or when you take the patient up for surgery what you planned is a medial opening wedge turns out to be a dramatic amount of laxity and then you go ahead and do a tcvo so it's in excess of 70% i think are people who need this i have had instances where i have done only the distal femoral osteotomy as in some orthopedic surgeons and that has served well that has done well i have done judiciously double level osteotomies i have judiciously in 5 to 10% of them there's no mediolateral laxity and in large deformities i have done a focal dome to correct the large deformity without going into the intraarticular component so i think the intraarticular component now i am beginning to see forms i think 70% of the indications so can i ask a question yes please so- in your experience for uh, beginners and juniors what are the clinical findings or radiological findings you will say this is 1 2 3 if present these are not the candidates for the regular osteotomy you had to do so what are the clinical features right sir so the first thing is examine the patient walking in your chamber then you see a lateral thrust 
be aware that this could be number one lateral thrust when you, the patient walks into your chamber. You suspect you get him to raise his clothes, her clothes. You see the knee joint clearly from the front and the back. That's the first yeah. red herring, the warning sign. Second thing is when the patient lies down on the couch, you relax the patient a bit and test gently after you know all the rest of the clinical exam for medial lateral laxity in full extension. It's a surprising amount you find. And then you know, hey, this is, this is an unstable knee. This is the degenerative instability, not the post-traumatic instability. That's the, these are the two main things. And, uh, and then when we go to the x-rays, firstly, the mechanical axis deviation, when it's less than 10% or less than zero, is the MAD is not touching, the mechanical axis is not touching the joint line. That's the first red herring because we did two different studies. One study done five plus years ago, it took 120 long leg films and the correlation between mechanic, I showed this mechanical axis deviation, less than 10% and an increased JLCA was 0.66. A second study we did much later showed that when we cut off the mechanical axis deviation to 0%, that the mechanical axis is just not touching the joint, is more medial. The correlation with an increased CPA, condylar plateau angle measured very carefully was 0.62 Pearson's R. So start suspecting that there may be, you know, presence of a, then you look at good AP, good AP x-rays without, by eliminating the flexion deformity and you find that depression of the condyle. So the JLCA and the CPA, the large MAD, these are the red herrings. Now, if you have a large mechanical axis deviation, but no medial lateral laxity and is a young patient and is active, by all means, he deserves a double level osteotomy. By all means, a distal femur closing, lateral closing wedge and a medial opening wedge in the tibia because then you're not messing around with the limb length. It's a wonderful. In the young people, fully deserving. And, you know, uh, with, with good equipment like the precision saw and all that, wonderful. Okay, but that's a small subset. The people who come to us are people who can't walk more than a few steps. I don't know what is your experience, sir, but my demographic, patient demographic is, you know, most of the patients come to the, for surgery, they agree to surgery when they are really miserable and they are not necessarily patients who can tolerate a double level. So the laxity, the instability, which is unmasked under anesthesia and radiological pointers should point you to the fact that, hey, we are looking at an intra-articular osteotomy. We are looking at an intra-articular deformity, a degenerative instability, and the presence of osteophytes will highlight that. Why do osteophytes form? Because the body wants to stabilize. And there's exceedingly high amount of, uh, you know, all the growth factors in the osteophyte because the newly forming bone is getting accreted added on day by day as the patient walks. So that should point to the presence of osteophytes should point to instability. Um, so these are the things. So you be aware. And now there is some literature. So I have now come across these eight or nine articles, which have nine or 10 articles, and I'm sure more will come very soon. Dinesh, 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 Dr. Milan, how do you, yes, sir, yes, sir. What, what were you asking? No, no, if you, you have any uh, questions, comments. No, oh, bus, uh, I am not a, a person, I don't uh, have done much, any of the TCBO, but I agree with the principles what Dr. Melin has uh, said are uh, very interesting, but somehow I find it technically difficult as compared to my close wedge, what I'm actually doing. So just to start, I'm thinking to just to start TCBO, but looking to the technical difficulties, uh, I refrain myself for TCBO. Let's hope in future, probably I will do TCBO also. So the, the, the difference between you and me is you still have dark hair and you have lots of hair. By trying out all these new things, I have lost my sleep. I have lost my hair. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Dr. Milan, how do you remove the osteophytes from a midline and how far do you go to remove them? 
are not midlines. We take the incisions in the medial and the lateral parapatellar, uh, you know, the patellofemoral retinacular we release. Yeah. Not from the midlines, sir. No, the skin yeah. incision is midline. You give both parapatellar incisions. Yes, sir. And then you... The, the skin is central. And then inside the windows are two parapatellar windows. Two parapatellar windows. And then you can go uh, up to the lateral end of the tibia to remove the osteophytes. Yes, sir. so far I have succeeded in, because I don't want to mess around with the deep MCL. So I've not tried to remove actively the osteophytes in the tibia. Now the thing is in the femur, what I'm doing in the last couple of, you know, many last 15 odd cases is I'm using the subvastus approach. I'm extending the incision inside like a subvastus, elevating like they do the subvastus TKR, elevate the vastus medialis, obliquus vastus medialis from the you know, so that gives, uh, when you flex the knee, you can better see the osteophytes and go down all the way in the femur. The TBI, I am a little reluctant because I don't want to mess with the deep MCL. The osteophytes you are, you are talking mainly are from the femur. Yes, sir. Yes, right. sir. Very reluctant to touch the tibial osteophytes. Right. I don't know how, how the deep MCL will behave. So I not yet gathered the courage to do that. So, if there are some more questions or uh, we if there are no questions, we close this and before that I would like to I don't know why I'm not able to share this screen. So with, with your permission, uh, Sanjay, may yes, I sir. just point out that this year too, we are going to have the HTO 360, the second avatar. And I welcome you all and the viewers. It's uh, the dates are first, second and third of December. We are going to right. have the physical presence of Professor Teramoto and Professor Nombuyuki Takenaka. And we're going to have, you know, the entire program like we did the last year it's a very exciting subject clement especially to point out to you that yes if the that the more you know there's a lot of depth that we can get into and uh, it's going to be dedicated to you know high tibial osteotomies of different types last year we showed four different types on medial opening wedge uh, i did a one medial opening wedge dr ajit patel performed a tcvo with the elizaro i did the focal dome condylar osteotomy and i did a distal femoral osteotomy so we demonstrated the subjects. We, we had a sawbones workshop and we had a lot of intense discussions about each and every aspect. And people loved it. It was limited. Even this year, we're going to have a limited seating capacity of only 50. So you're most welcome. Please join in. And I'm quite hopeful that you will enjoy, if not learn from the proceedings. Uh, I was about to mention all that, but uh, as part of the efforts which we have made at Knee Preservation Subcommittee, we did webinar on basics on 8th April, then 22nd, I did a face-to-face -face on uh, medial open with high tibia osteotomy in Kanpur. On 10th June, we did webinar, one topic, one speaker, STO by Ravi Mittal. 1st July, we had a close with STO webinar. And today we had this TCVO webinar by Dr. Milan Chaudhary. Now the future is on 2nd September, we are planning a webinar on medial open wedge high TB osteotomy in which Dr. Mangal and I will be speaking. Then in October, we will have a webinar on TCVO in which I request Dr. Milan to present and Dr. Distal Femoral Osteotomy Dr. Mangal will speak. Then we have face-to-face -face program on 26th November at Rajkot, Modern Techniques of Knee Preservation. And then what you have said in first to third at Apola, which I have said in your introduction. And on 13th December, we have pre-conference workshop at Lucknow. 
in between if there are any requests from any part of the country for any lectures hands on workshop drawing exercise video presentation we are ready for it so wherever you think there is a scope to propagate knee preservation please let me know and we will try to do justice to it And with this, we like to uh, close the session. I thank Dr. Midin Chaudhary, Dr. Mangal, Dr. Joseph, Dr. Ajit, and Dr. Dinesh for their time effort. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Mangal. Thank you, Sanjay, very much. Thank you, Clement, for being here, Dr. Ajit and Dinesh. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.